For more videos on people's struggles, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello, you're watching News Click and People's Dispatch. The Africa Cup of Nations is on right now. Today is today's Thursday. Today is the day when the second semi-final will be held. We have been we've been seeing a lot of very exciting action on the football pitch, but also a lot of dramatic developments outside, and some of these developments often not talked about so much. It's in this context, of course, that a very important editorial recently appeared in New Frame called The Ugly Side of the Beautiful Game, talking about the mass the deaths that took place outside the Paul Beer Stadium in Cameroon. We'll talk more about that, of course. But also about the way football is often used to whitewash the crimes of dictators of authoritarian states, of corrupt sports managers, all these issues. There's a lot more than just what's happening on the pitch. To talk more about this, we're joined by Jabulu Ngidi, the sports editor of New Frame. We also have with us our colleague Siddhant of NewsClick. Jabulu, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Right, so our uh, first question, of course, is that uh, the, the massacre, outside, the stampede outside the stadium did make a lot of news, but you know, it was seen more of as a one-off incident, just uh, you know, an unfortunate accident maybe that just happens in the kind of these kind of sports tournaments. But there is a far more larger politics around it related to Paul Beer, the president of Cameroon, the way he sort of administered the country, and a much larger politics around it. So could you maybe first take us through some of those key aspects as well? Yeah, I think the the nation's cup going to Cameroon was always a propaganda tool for Paul Beer. It's not just about the tournament. I mean, his support has been dwindling. Uh, the Anglophone crisis where the minority English-speaking part of, of Cameroon have been protesting since 2017 because of the marginalization they suffer from the majority French government is something that has been key in this. I mean, the people who are fighting for secession have said that they would like to use this tournament as a, an opportunity to amplify their voice and, and, and their point across because the Anglophone crisis hasn't really been covered across the world. I mean, it's something that has been largely ignored. And this is something that they wanted to use the Nations Cup to, to sort of drive their message across. And Paul Beer wanting to use this tournament as a tool really to, to cement his power. I mean, the guy has been president of Cameroon since the 80s. This is arguably one of the toughest uh, period of his time with numerous calls calling for his head. So there's been a heavy security presence uh, throughout the country because of those threats, especially in Limbe, which is uh, part of the English speaking region. So because of that heavy security presence, getting in and out of stadium has been a mission. Uh, Issa, uh, the KEF president, uh, Patrice Motepe, uh, when he held a press conference to discuss the stampede, he said that he spent two hours trying to get at Olembe, which is named after Paul Pia. I mean, that that's telling when the guy who has a police escort who can be whisked in and out of a stadium within minutes takes two hours. So imagine how the, the normal men on the streets, how much time that they would have to spend uh, getting in and out. So the, it's, it's with that background that this is where the heavy police presence is coming from. And the whole idea of using this nation, the nation's cup to, to paint this beautiful picture of a thriving Cameroon and a president who's got everything under control that this came. And the irony of all of this is it coming in a stadium named after him. I think in a way it's a reflection of, of where Cameroon is under Paul Beer with the heavy military presence and the, the the, the challenges that are within Cameroon that are being tried to mask by, through various means, including football. And, and it was sad to, to see lives being lost, especially people coming to watch a football game. But it, it, for, for me, the stampede isn't just something that should be viewed in isolation because it speaks to a bigger issue of what this tournament was aimed to do and the, the challenge that is in Cameroon and how Paul Beer is trying to, to fight for, for control and remain uh, through all the years that he's been in charge of the country. All right. So, Jabul, uh, in this context, of course, we do know that football always, football, all sport for that matter, always has been used by authoritarian rulers, uh, you know, problematic states to sort of say, uh, like, like we said, whitewash their crimes, to pretend they do not exist. But could you also talk about how uh, the game maybe is also in some senses served as a space for resistance itself and how in the context of this tournament specifically, it's being seen as well. Yeah, I think the, the power of, of sport and football in particular, I mean, it's the most watched 
uh, sport in the world, that power is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's good in that because of the power that it has, uh, the, the eyes balls who are there. I mean, the World Cup is the most watched sporting event in the world. So because of, of that power, it, it pulls a lot of sponsors. It pulls a lot of attention. So it can be used for a number of things. Uh, we've seen in the past where the likes of uh, Didier Drogba with Ivory Coast, where he used the Ivorians qualifying for the 2006 World Cup as an opportunity to call for unity and the warring parties to come together and not just support Ivory Coast, but also help build a strong country. We've seen with Socrates in Brazil, uh, with, with Corinthians and how football was used as a, as a tool to sort of stand up against an authoritarian regime. I mean, we've we've seen so many instances, even in Egypt um, with the ultras. I mean, they've been key, same with Algeria. Ultras were key in overthrowing uh, both Hosni Barak and Abdelaziz in Algeria. So sport is that in terms of, it's, it's a political symbol. In South Africa, it was used as a place for, to stand up against apartheid. I mean, even before non-racialism was a thing, Football was a place where black and whites can mix together and play, and, and that was a middle finger to the apartheid regime. But because of where things are at now, money runs sport. Uh, you see that with the Saudis uh, buying Newcastle. Uh, and a lot of Newcastle fans are happy. They don't care about that the regime killed and dismembered a journalist. That that doesn't register in, in their attention. I mean, what is important is that they finally have a rich man owning their club, which means that they can, can, can fight with the likes of City and the likes of Manchester United and, and fighting for top players and fighting for honours. So because of the power and the love that we have, I mean, a lot of people go drops and downs with their football teams. It's, easy, it's not hard to just drop because now they suddenly have a problematic figure in charge because that figures, those figures come and goes, but the love that you have for your team and the national team is so strong. So that, that love is abused by these people because of the heavy presence of money to, to whitewash the regime. I mean, now when, when we talk of Qatar and we talk of, of uh, even the, with, with PSG, the first thing that comes to mind isn't so much the humanitarian uh, human rights violations there or even what's happening to workers in, in, in who are building those stadiums in Qatar. It's look at what they've done to Man City. They've transformed this team into a one of the most lethal and, and exciting to watch football teams. And we do enjoy watching Man City because Pep Guardiola has turned them into, into a machine. But we also have to acknowledge that that machine is built on blood and it's because of, of that love that we have that our regime are able to, to use the power that sport has to sort of massage and whitewash the regime. I mean, you saw even at Pinochet and also in South America, when they would host the World Cup, it, it's essentially that. It's not because they want to, to the good of their people or the huge fans of the sport. It's just the power that it has. And, and even this, the Nations Cup in Cameroon, this will buy Paul Beer a moment of reprieve because even after the stampede, there were still people who wanted to go and watch the Nations Cup. You've got the best players in the world coming here. I mean, Sadio Mane is there, Salah. It's, it's an exciting, it's a party. They haven't hosted the Nations Cup in 50 years. So there's still that love. So as the man responsible for that, he will be adored by most of the football loving public. And that's how a lot of people get away with these things because of, of our love for football. It's, it's very hard. I also, I doubt I, I, could, I have the capability to say I'm boycotting the Nations Cup because it's in Cameroon. It's the same with the World Cup in Qatar. With everything and all the problems that are there, as a football fan, it's hard to say I won't watch this because of this. But I think there needs to get to a point where we're at that level because our love is being abused and, and used to to essentially cover up for, for so many violent and, and criminal uh, crimes. Yeah, if I, if I can uh, jump in uh, for a second, you know, we had a very similar uh, just before uh, a very nasty second COVID wave hit uh, India, uh, things had opened up for a little while and, and in that process, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated a stadium named after himself where 100,000 people yeah. were packed in and we, we cannot, uh, there will be never any data to actually tell us how many people uh, suffered as a consequence of that decision to have that tournament in those uh, circumstances. 
So very much uh, what you're saying is felt, I think, uh, around the world. And I think people will resonate with that, uh, that idea of love being uh, abused. But, but I want to ask you about, that because there's been so much going on and all of this, uh, for those of us who are watching from you know, far away, uh, it's a context of, uh, or looking at what's happening in, in Cameroon, uh, but also listening to the noise coming out of Europe. So Infantino's statements, uh, for example, uh, which, I mean, it, it was... <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah it, it left all of us uh, speechless and also confused about what the purpose of, of all of this is. So, so first up, if you can give me a sense of how uh, you guys received those comments. Yeah, I think it's, you know, the first was horror and disgust because, I mean, the, the context that Infantino is saying that not because he cares about African migrants, that's the list of things that he worries about. He just wants to get the World Cup played every two years because that's more money for FIFA. That's essentially what this is. And to achieve that, he will use everything, blackmail and disgusting comments like this to sort of help rubber stamp that. I think uh, Kev and even the continent at large, I think there's been that, especially leading up to this Nations Cup where Europeans were sort of bossing national teams uh, on when they can get their players. I mean, contractually for an international tournament, clubs have to release players two weeks before. And Kev, uh, Europe went up in arms and uh, there's some players who didn't like Dennis at Watford who ended up not even coming to, to the Nations Cup because of that. So it starts from there in terms of how Europe has been disrespecting the continent in viewing this not as a one of the major global competition, but as an inconvenience in their league. So that is something that should be taken with what Infantino says with at the back of your mind, that for, for most Europeans, Africa and African football was an inconvenience when it messes up with their leagues. But when it comes to them making money out of it, then oh, they care, they love and adore us. And I think the, the sad part is the current Kev regime under Petrus Motepe, who's a South African. And it's said in that he was, he didn't necessarily win the elections. He was handpicked by Infantino to be his proxy at Kev. And you see even with that statement, I mean, everyone, when they hit that statement, it was sheer disgust that how dare can you say something so insulting? And also even with the lives that are lost, to even use that as a political campaign is disgusting. So most of Africa was disgusted, but Kev, because they are essentially controlled by Infantino and Kev and FIFA, the, the message was that, ah, he was caught out of context. We know what he meant. Uh, Gianni is a fan of Africa. And that's not true. He is a fan of Africa when it gets him votes, when it gets him what he wants, not because he cares about the interest of, of, of Africa. Because if, if he was genuinely a fan of, of, of Africa, when this whole European farce was happening and clubs refusing to release players and making noise about the Afcon being an inconvenience and saying that it shouldn't happen, a friend would have stood up and said, stop this nonsense. This is a major tournament. We have to support it. I mean, the, 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 the Euros were much dangerous than this because they're held in different tournaments when COVID was really bad. And you look at Europe, Europe has been devastated by COVID. And you look at the effects in Africa, I mean, it hasn't been that bad. Even the numbers in Cameroon aren't, say, like it, it's the case with England. And England is one of the venues that hosted Euros. And that was okay when it was them, but now when it's Africa, it's there. So this is a continuation of Africa being used for, for votes and resources. And when it has nothing to offer, it's thrown away. So, uh, Jabulu, when does uh, the enemy of my enemy become my friend? <laughs> because, you know, the, we're watching from Asia, right? And, and uh, we're looking at, let's say, the CAF supporting uh, the idea of a twice uh, a biennial uh, World Cup because it does become a middle finger to Europe in many ways. Uh, UEFA loses the money that FIFA gains and part of what FIFA gains then goes to Africa. <laughs> at, least the, at least the federations. Uh, yeah, I this is why the, for Africa... The Binal World Cup is, it makes sense because that's also how the Nations Cup is held. And part of the driving force for the Nations Cup was that the host nation is going to improve in terms of resources and infrastructure that is going to be built for to host this. So for, for Africa, there isn't much to lose in a Binal World Cup. 
uh, because of the money that is going to go to federations for preparations. That, that's why, and, and that's where Africa is speaking from in terms of, of, of the financial rewards. It, it makes sense for, for the continent that, because that's essentially why the, the AFCON is there every two years. It makes financial sense for care from the sponsors, but also for the federations. So federations would never speak ill of, of something that makes them money. And that's where you wait and that's why uh, <laughs> Kev has a thorny relationship with, with FIFA in that in certain moments, their decision favor Africa, but it's not favoring Africa in that because they care, it's because it makes them financial sense. So that's, that's why like Infantino, I mean, he slaps us with one hand and then caresses us with the other. And it, it's, it's a very complicated relationship. So uh, thank you so much both uh, Jabulu and Siddhant for uh, this conversation. We'll keep coming back to some of these issues. It's been an interesting and educative experience for me also. I'll happily admit. So thank you both of you and you're watching News Click and People's Dispatch. We'll come back to you soon.